Hello. Welcome to Worship from the Angus, Dundee and Perthshire Methodist Circuit. I'm Sue Marshall Jennings and I'll lead today and Julia Walsh is joining me in leading in prayers. Welcome. We come to worship knowing that God wants us to live up to his high standards May we learn to live as he asks, treating everyone as Jesus would. Amen. integrity, God of truth and wisdom, we worship and adore you. Jesus, who lived without sin, who lived life in all its fullness, we worship and adore you. Holy Spirit, who leads and guides us to live with honesty and sincerity, we worship and adore you. Jesus, we thank and praise you that you have taught us another way, that you have given us life in all its fullness. Thank you that when we seek you with all our heart, we are choosing that life. Thank you that you have offered us a different path, a path of truth, a path of humility, a path of wisdom, a path of integrity, a path of of honesty. Through your example here on earth, you showed us how to live peaceful lives, how to reconcile with others, how to follow you and seek wholeness. Thank you that we have all of that in you. You reconciled us on the cross and we are truly grateful. Reconciling God, Forgive us when we make the wrong choices, when our decisions are not of honesty and integrity. Reconciling God, 
we choose life. Forgive us when we hurt others by our words and actions. Reconciling God, we choose life. Forgive us when we judge others and think ourselves better. Reconciling God, we choose life. Forgive us when relationships break down and we do not want to repair them. Reconciling God, we choose life. Forgive us when we don't strive for peace. Reconciling God, we choose life, life in all its fullness in you. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that in you we have new life. We choose life today through the cross. We are healed and restored. We are reconciled with one another in you. We thank you that we are forgiven and can again live in love and peace with all. We ask only that you receive our love and our gifts freely given for you, poor as they may be, and bless them and use them to the glory of your kingdom today and always. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 119, reading the first eight verses. Happy are they whose way of life is blameless, who conform to the law of the Lord. Happy are they who obey his instruction, who set their heart on finding him, who have done no wrong, but who have lived according to his will. You, Lord, have laid down your precepts that are to be kept faithfully. If only I might hold a steady course, keeping your statutes. Then, if I fixed my eyes on all your commandments, I should never be put to shame. I shall praise you in sincerity of heart as I learn your just decrees. I shall observe your statutes. Do not leave me forsaken. Amen. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, 
You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father, not my mother, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father, not my mother, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the stranger, not my neighbor, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the stranger, not my neighbor, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Many of you know that I am the local preacher secretary um, for the circuit. And as such, I tend to have some input into the plan. But I think I have decided that I'm going to check what the lectionary readings are before I say that I'm available for certain weeks. Because that reading from Matthew is kind of terrifying for people like me. I'm divorced. I remarried. And when you see all that stuff in that reading, you think, that's it. There's no hope for me whatsoever. Absolutely none. And I agonised about including that previous song, spiritual song, 
It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord. Not my brother, not my sister, but me. In need of prayer. And you know, in many ways that does sum up that chapter from Matthew. If I'd had last week's readings, I think I'd have been all right. The Beatitudes. Blessed are these people, blessed are those people. They should be comforted, they should be healed. Whereas this week, it's all about you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Make sure you don't get caught out on this. Don't do that. In a way, Jesus is filling the loopholes, if you like, because let's face it, all along there has been a set of precepts, a set of rules that were given to the people in the commandments way back, way, way back. All of which Jesus' followers would have known. And then we get this passage from Matthew. Um, and here, all of us are shown, we're shown up really, aren't we, by this inner spotlight. We've got certain pockets of behaviour where we excuse ourselves, either because we consider what we do is not that bad, or because we keep to the letter of the law, but refutes it in spirit. There's a huge guilt trip to be had here in this teaching. It's also um, a sort of existential despair over our inherent sinfulness. And I wonder there whether there's a sense just throwing your hands up and saying, but there's no point, is there? There's no point in doing this. No point in changing or anything. And I wonder too if it's passages like this that put people off coming to church or believing or joining a community of believers. It's almost like nobody's good enough. But let's try and unpack this a little bit more. I think one of the other reasons that I'm finding it quite hard with this passage is because I've been reading some stuff by Nadia Boltz Weber this week. And she is a chaplain to a women's prison. How easy, how difficult it must be to preach to women in prison imprisoned for committing crimes. So what does this passage say to people who have done some of these things? Does it say that you're not worthy of God's love, that you're out with the bounds of God's love? I think probably the answer, we need to go back a bit from this actual passage that's been set out for us today. If we go back to verse 17, Jesus says, do not suppose that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to complete. Like I said earlier, there's almost a sense of filling the loopholes, you know, instead of just sticking to the law, it's not sticking to the law that we're being asked to do. It's to go beyond that. So it's not instilling a sense of guilt. It's not... Um, instilling that despair over our circumstances and, and the things that we've done. More than that, it's to encourage us to act and change things. It's not about perfection. I don't think God really expects us to be perfect. He knows that by our very nature we can't. But there's a sense of wholeness or complete wholeness that we can reach. It's a sense of integrity. Integrity in terms of God's commandments reaching beyond or obedience to God's commandments reaching beyond just a 
a legal conformity. We need guidelines. We do need guidelines. They're useful for our well-being. And that's the thread that runs through all of Jesus' teaching. That we choose life from our whole being rather than just following the rules. Living with integrity in all aspects of our life. Jesus points out that there aren't big sins and smaller sins. There are sins. Thinking aloud about doing something offensive to God reflects the state of our heart. The guidelines given for us are there. We can't enforce them on others. But what we can do is to recognise that God knows our hearts. We're called to be all the time wholehearted, sincere, honest, pure, not rude, not angry, and so on. If we have fallen out with a brother or a sister, it's our responsibility to sort it out, whoever started it. Even if it takes as much courage to cut off a hand, I'm not sure that that's really what God wants. Cutting off hands and plucking out eyes isn't suggested as our punishment for wrongdoing. Rather, it describes the radical scale of the action that we may need to take to change or amend our lives to prevent us going astray. Why would we contemplate cutting off a hand or plucking out an eye and doing these awful things? All we have to do to avoid that is to choose a lifestyle and an attitude that reflects a life of integrity as a follower of Jesus. Called to be wholehearted, sincere, honest, don't let bad thoughts win. When someone offends you, do you get your own back? They'll be judged for what they do. It's our response that will be judged. And I think judgment is something else that I've been, I don't say battling with, but certainly thinking about this week, because we do. We automatically judge people. We judge other people. We're not very good at judging ourselves. Yes, yes, I'm all right, really. You know, I'm a, I'm a good person, really. We can gloss over a lot of things, call them small sins or whatever. Little white lie. And I think half the battle, if you like, is working out when we're going astray, when we're being judgmental. I put myself up a few times this week, you know, thinking you've made assumptions, you've made judgments. It's not necessarily correct. But at the same time, it's what I felt at the time. So there is a sense in all of us that we need to embrace this completeness, this wholeness of thinking, well, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus what was his reaction be? Do not commit murder. That's right at the start of that reading from Matthew. Uh, well, I don't think many of us would or wouldn't intend to. But it's that total destruction, isn't it? When you talk about murder, it, it's an ending, it's finished, it's done. And it's that scale the total scale of how much we have to change in order to be true followers of Jesus. We go back to that spiritual song. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. We can't go on blaming other people. We can't go on leaving something to other people. We can't go on letting somebody else do it for us. It's time to wake up and make sure that our lives 
a complete whole have integrity and make us true followers of Jesus Christ in our time in this world taking action thinking the right way choosing it is about choosing feelings choosing the way we are and instead of being put off by words like this judgmental passages like this we should be encouraged encouraged by these to make sure that we do not fall into that trap of going off the rails of straying from the way but remind be reminded this is what we are called to do to follow Jesus with all of us with all of ourselves not just by blind obedience to the laws but coming from the heart in all that we do Amen Oh
for your world, we think firstly about the crisis situations caused by natural disasters everywhere, but especially those affected by the earthquakes in Turkey and in already war-damaged Syria. We pray, Lord, for all those grieving the loss of loved ones, for those still trapped under the rubble, especially where trained recovery teams can't reach and who are losing hope of being rescued for those still not knowing whether their loved ones are alive or not, for those injured and in places where insufficient or no medical aid is available, for those who's lost everything, sleeping in cars or in any sheltered place in winter storms and sub-zero temperatures, for the many thousands without the basics of life, water, food, warm clothing, electricity, things that we take for granted. For the rescue workers and medical workers and the people on the streets who are desperately fighting to help, all of them seeing horrific things and being scarred by them for life, but still continuing with their work. We also think at this time of people affected by the wildfires in Chile, the mudslides in Peru, those in the 10 areas of Africa predicted to be affected by flooding soon. Those in Pakistan still trying to rebuild their lives, which were affected by the flooding. Those starving through drought in Somalia, South Sudan and Ethiopia, and through both drought and flooding in Afghanistan. For those affected by cholera in Haiti and Syria. Gracious God, we ask for you to pour down love and mercy on all of these, your children, and give them strength and hope for the future. We ask that you forgive us when we doubt your presence in the world when faced with disasters of this magnitude, and ask that you use us to do your work here. We pray too for children abused, neglected, criticised and bullied for those suffering from illness whose choices have been taken away from them, for the victims of violence and those who live in fear and for those whose anger makes them bear grudges. We pray for families in conflict, separated from each other with no support system. We pray for churches, communities and nations where division and prejudice have undermined trust and where pain and discord go unhealed. For those in war zones and refugees whose lives and homes have been destroyed and those whose food sources have been disrupted by war. We pray for your beautiful world and all the things we have carelessly done to destroy it. We pray for ourselves in every area of our lives where we have not grown into the people we could be and for your help so that we can see and begin to address these issues. O oh God, you created the universe in love and care for everything you made. You call us to love you and to love our neighbours as ourselves. Call us back to your way of love and inspire us to live as true followers of the gospel of peace. In our need and our longing for, for your kingdom, God of growth, may we hear your call. Amen. Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, 
this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. this week so as we go about our lives again loving God we want to use our strong feelings to bring change our words to encourage our gifts to heal our eyes to see as you see our hands to give help Lord, we choose life. We choose you. Amen. Christ, my comforter, 